Bonjour à tous, so thank you very much for watching us today. I'm your host, I'm Christophe Langlois. I'm the Global Fintech and Developer Ecosystem Marketing Lead at Finastra. And this is another live meetups in a series we're conducting during our hackathon. I don't know if everybody knows, but you should. Uh, until You've got the, until the 20th of December this year to join. And basically what we're trying to do is aiming to redefine finance for good. So we've got already close to 4,000 participants from more than 75 countries. So please um, check the links which will be in the description and join the movement. Today, we're discussing a very important topic, the topic of diversity. So the fintech industry, of course, is, is uh, suffering from uh, a few challenges there. First of all, uh, there are far too many women. As employees in the UK, I believe just 30% of the workforce uh, is um, a female and women workforce. Then the founders and leaders as well, just about 17% of the senior fintech roles are held by women. And thirdly, we don't really talk about it, but it's user base and not just in the UK. Of course, today we're going to talk and we're going to go over and beyond fintech. We're going to talk about diversity in tech and also entrepreneurship. And basically the idea is to hopefully change the very fabric of our societies for the better. Also, only 7%, for instance, of partners in the top 100 VC firms are women, which means that that causes troubles uh, for women and female entrepreneurs trying to raise money for their new uh, ideas and ventures. 12% of engineers at Silicon Valley uh, startups are women, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, it's not just about uh, gender today. We're going to touch other areas uh, like ethnicity, age, religion, culture. So again, uh, I'm extremely excited today and honored to be the host of this session because we've got an exceptional lineup of uh, speakers. So first of all, because we're not uh, in a real room, I'm going to do a round of applause for everybody. So thank you very much. Um, so we've got three great um, experts and champions for diversity. We're going to start with uh, Nadia, who is going to introduce herself. And Nadia is also a podcaster extraordinaire. So uh, Nadia, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Christoph. Um, and thank you to Finastra as well for hosting such a fantastic event. I think that um, we all need to be working incredibly hard to drive positive change within the industry and events like this are, are, are brilliant as long as we all take action from it. So just to give a bit of background to myself, I'm one of the MDs and the co-founder of the Harrington Star Group. Um, we are a recruitment agency that places tech and sales staff into financial services technology, financial services corporates and fintechs. Um, we started the company 10 years ago. Uh, when we started, we wanted to be unique, uh, and anyone that's dealt with any recruitment agency will know that this is almost um, almost something that everyone talks about. They want to be different. And what we wanted to do 10 years ago was actually create something that meant that it would be really easy for us to say how different we were, and actually we wouldn't need to say it because we were just being it. And what we've decided to do and what we have built is we've built a unique and, and added value and value-add community by building a network with a pay it forward concept. So um, we run a number of events ourselves. Um, we uh, produce a magazine every quarter. Uh, last magazine got downloaded over 15,000 times. Um, we run numbers of roundtables, uh, video interviews. You've mentioned my podcasts. Um, and we share market insights, all for free, to really build and educate and, and help network a community with all the topics that we need to understand about one another to make one another better. Um, I know Finastra has over 90,000 followers, but us ourselves, we are proud to say that we have over 57,000 now, um, all within the technology, fintech, financial services technology space. Um, and I myself, I've been in recruitment for 17 years now. So I've always said I see my role as responsibility to drive positive change, change in the industry to make it fairer, more equal. Um, and I think that, that to make that happen, we have to work on it. We have to commit to it. Um, and I drive that forward with particular reference to gender equality. I, I'm very, very passionate about diversity and all its forms. But I know today I'll be talking with particular focus to gender equality. Um, for us as a recruitment agency, every placement we make is about 
building upon that individual's career and building upon the business that they are working within. For us, it's not just about finding someone a job, it's about building a career. And this to me is has huge, huge ties with what we're talking about today. Diversity and inclusion to me is totally linked to people being confident, supported and working at their best. So for me, it's about making the industry better and making the economy better. You've mentioned my podcast series. I've now interviewed over um, 100 C-level and leadership women in fintech. Um, and today I hope to really share a lot of the knowledge that I've gained from them. So I could go on forever, but I think that's my <laughs> intro. Thank you, Crystal. No, thank you very much, Nadia. It was great. And it's not a competition, the number of followers, you know, no, con no competition, especially well. between uh, our peers. Uh, thank you so much for the intro. Yeah, very clear. The second, so please second the champion and the expert in uh, diversity is Cecile. So please, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Christoph. I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but um, I know a little bit. And yeah, thanks for the uh, invite to this uh, this um, live stream. I think it's such an important topic, as uh, Nadi was saying um, already. So I'm one of the directors at Foundervine, and uh, three years ago we set up Foundervine to uh, bridge a gap that we saw that uh, very few companies or the government was bridging, which was there weren't enough entrepreneurs or tech entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds uh, creating and scaling companies and we know that uh, building business is the uh, is the pillar in our society of building wealth and access to opportunity um, and because we didn't see enough people uh, uh, building startups and scaling them um, it meant that you know a, a group of people were continuously going to be left out of um, opportunities in society, which leads to economic issues and social issues. So Foundervine was started to help people take their ideas uh, and turn them into business models, pitch them, and then turn those into businesses and scale those businesses up um, ultimately for investment, but also the satisfaction of those ambitious founders that have the perseverance uh, to create a company. Um, so right now we offer a range of things like programs, so accelerator programs, incubator programs, um, evening uh, education sessions on things such as uh, digital skilling or marketing or sales or cash flow and finance, uh, a number of different topics that would help um, a founder take their business from idea stage to, uh, right the way to uh, being a successful business. And we're not trying to create the next Facebook. We are simply trying to encourage diversity in uh, startups and help people achieve satisfaction in their lives and empower people in their communities to do the same. And what I hope to um, share today is my insight in being in Founder Vine for the last few years, but also my um, history in, in being in the financial sector um, where I used to do consulting. Um, and, you know, experiences I've had there and observations that I have. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecil. And uh, last but not least, our very own Chief People and Places Officer, Sharon, the floor is yours. Uh, I can't unmute you, so please unmute yourself. Thank uh, you. You got me? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, got you. Uh, I have to say, Christoph, it's lovely to see you in action and uh, great to be on uh, a panel um, uh, with Nadia and um, Cecil. Um, so Chief People and Places Officer here at Finastra. I, I've been in fintech now uh, only for 18 months, so um, I'm looking forward to uh, learning from uh, the rest of the panel that have been involved in it for a little while longer. I, uh, I'm here at uh, Finastra, so for those that don't know, Finastra is the number one pure play software um, uh, fintech player in the world. Um, uh, we have about 10,000 people and over 8,500 customers uh, across um, uh, many, many countries, probably 70 plus countries um, are, are customers. Uh, in terms of me personally, um, I uh, when I'm not at Finastra, I'm a mom. I would say... Um, uh, amongst friends that I'm a feminist, have been since I was a, a child, a champion generally of any underdog. Yeah, so I'm sort of drawn 
to people that um, aren't able to, um, uh, you know, be be treated equally and and tend to sort of find a passion in trying to sort of, um, you know, help uh, help help them get access to uh, the same as uh, everyone else. In terms of my background, uh, so um, before Finastra, I worked for a company called Vodafone, so a large um, global telecommunications company. And um, I was very fortunate. I did many things there. But one of the things was um, in the diversity and inclusion work that we did, I engaged with over a billion people um, over six six or seven years when I uh, looked after that agenda around diversity and inclusion. And we, we were lucky enough to launch a number of uh, global firsts uh, whilst I was uh, whilst I was there in this area. And it was interesting for, for me um, over a period of time, we went from about early 20 percent of women in our top 200 to um, about 30 uh, percent as I was leaving. Now, I turned up, as I said, at Finastra about 18 months ago and do many things here. But of course, I'm absolutely a champion of inclusion and diversity. And what's been fantastic is that we've been able to go from 22% women in our top 200 to just about 30% right now. So in 18 months. So it took me 10 years in, Finastra, in Vodafone, 18 months uh, in Finastra. So um, I think I've got a bit of a formula about how you do this. It boils down to three things. One, uh, you've got to have... Um, a big ambition yeah so you have to dream big the second is uh, you need to light fire so you need to not just talk about it but you need to do real things and I'm sure we're going to talk about what some of those are and then the third thing is you absolutely have to create a movement both inside your company but increasingly uh, a much bigger movement across the world if you really want to have an impact in inclusion and diversity so uh, great to be on the panel and um, back to you Christoph. Thank you so much, Sharon. We, we're lucky to have you here. Um, okay, so you everybody knows now how why I'm so excited today. We've got a great different uh, uh, depth of knowledge and angles again. Um, so from talent entrepreneurship and the corporate angle, which uh, complement each other. So first question, uh, let's go straight shoot for the star, right? <laughs> uh, many entrepreneurs today, so things are shifting. And more and more entrepreneurs think, believe that the purpose of companies is no longer just to satisfy um, their shareholders and generate value for them, but also that they have an obligation to better the communities and societies in which they operate. So is it something uh, you agree with? And again, is diversity in entrepreneurship a great way to create better society for everyone. And I'll ask you, Cecil, to start because it's one of your key topics there. Yeah, thanks. And that that is a really uh, good question. Um, I think, you know, the, the businesses of the past have been set up to serve uh, shareholders. And that largely has been the history of businesses, large businesses. Um, but now you see a younger generation that um, care and uh, about values a lot more than um you know than, than than before and companies are realizing that if they don't cater to those values um they're not going to have as many customers as they used to have so young people are kind of uh, forging uh, new pathways for businesses to listen to consumers about doing good and not simply just making loads of money for the shareholders um so things like you know sustainability um, you know, eco-friendly uh, products um, and also being fair to employees and, and having that those diversity agendas, they're important to the younger generation. And, and so what we're seeing is that uh, those businesses that fail to recognize this and take the steps to um, make their companies more inclusive or stop wasting uh, products and pollut polluting the environment, uh, they're being punished by the customer and therefore the shareholder gets punished ultimately. Um, and the second thing around um, entrepreneurship, I, I really believe that um, diversity, I, I don't like talking about diversity, believe it or not. I just like talking about not wasting st people's talents and, uh, and materials. And this society is becoming more and more diverse. Um, the world is is a diverse place. Um, and if we're not using people's full potential, uh, we're wasting stuff, right? And there are so many people from uh, backgrounds from Asia, from Africa, 
um, from New Zealand, Australia, wherever you, you name it, there are talented people there. And in the UK, we have a lot of talented people that um, are from uh, different generations of, of immigrants. And we need to make sure that those people, their talents are used uh, to the best of our ability. And we're not doing this right now. So mm -hmm. entrepreneurship offers that route for people to, to be able to do that. It's a, yeah, it's a very good point. And uh, again, it's essential to collectively be, being able to better the society we live in. Uh, Nadia, maybe from a talent standpoint, I mean, can you share your views on that topic? And especially if you're coaching or working with entrepreneurs or very early yeah, stage um, companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, Cecil's hit, like, hit the nail on the head there. Like, um, so what was going through my mind, uh, mission, values, purpose. Um, and that is, is such a huge driver nowadays. And I think it's the way he's just explained that is absolutely spot on. Um, yes, it all revolves back round to the shareholders, but the shareholders will be nothing without the customer. The shareholders will be nothing without people utilizing their their full talents and their talents come from so many different places and so many so many different backgrounds and so many different experiences and that is that's what brings a power to this this industry and and, and many others um but what i absolutely uh, feel i have to say is um you know i just want to sort of establish like my, my baseline as a recruiter and the visibility that i have so um just as what, what Cecil has said, I think I have I have such a brilliant um, vista in the sense that um, day in, day out, as someone who, who works within a recruitment agency, we are meeting with new companies. We're me meeting with older corporates, yes, but we are meeting with so many companies to understand what they are trying to do when it comes to growth or even when it comes to replacement of staff. And one thing that we do not do is just say, oh, let's have a look at that job description call. We'll come back to you with someone that's going to love it. Sure. Instead, we have a real in-depth conversation to understand the business, the culture, mission, values, purpose. Because nowadays, people are not going to move jobs. They're not going to want to join a family, a new family. And that's what people are calling it nowadays. They're not going to put their heart and soul into a company if they don't believe in it. And I think that there's one word that really, really just rings true in my mind as I'm talking about this, and it's authenticity. We've got to be authentic with what, what we're doing. And I think that, um, you know, the, the vision and what I've seen um, over the last few years, um, I've really been educated myself with how people are creating culture, how people are composing their teams, how boards are getting compensated. And I think all of this is allowing people to change the way they used to work. Cecil's right. It, we are nowhere near where we need to be, but this is a great, great baseline for us to be starting from. And it's much further forward than we have been. Yeah, and uh, there's so many different layers to it. But uh, I've always said in the UK and everywhere else, there's two things which are fundamentally important. It's your home and your job and your work because that, that fulfills you, that pays the bills. And I think that far too often, I mean, real estate agents and sometimes recruiter are not necessarily linked, you know, on that level, the level you just mentioned. So it's two fundamentally important uh, types of jobs or roles. And yet that impacts you on daily basis. And the industry still have, I think, to step up on many levels. Uh, thank you very much, Nadia. Uh, of course, Sharon, if you can bring your own uh, views mm. on that topic. And of course, culture, we'll talk about culture a bit later because it's hard especially in a huge organization to uh, yeah. change. So, so I had a, I had a little, um, uh, a little think about purpose and I, I, I did a bit of research. So I went back and I had a look. So Coke, uh, Coca-Cola, um, not that I ever drink it, but a hundred years ago, uh, they, they had a purpose, which was to make the world happy. Yeah. Disney, uh, not, not far after, um, was, was bringing more magic. Yeah. About 20 years ago, Google was um, helping us find more things. Yeah, so, um, and of course, you sort of come closer and closer and the purpose of companies has changed. And I think your point, Cecil, about, um, uh, you know, uh, different generations have different expectations. You see it coming through, yeah, where people, it's not just about selling your product and making everybody happy, you know, make, make, make the world happy. Nowadays, it's about what's the real impact um, that you're able to have for all the different stakeholders um, within um, within your ecosystem. So it's so it's interesting. So it's it's been knocking around. Purpose has been knocking around for a long time. It's just it's it's just evolved 
as um, as our social responsibility has um, has involved. And when I look at financial services, I, th I see two um, uh, uh, drivers, which I'm sure you do as well. One is about the democratization of access to financial services, and the other is transparency. Yeah, so those those two things are really big drivers um, uh, that that are almost the problems that are then creating the purpose that many um, fintechs are then um, are then trying to grapple with. And, and again, sticking with financial services, we know that there's some really big problems for all those fantastic fintechs out there to get on fusionfabric.cloud and create uh, solutions to, um, uh, uh, because we know over 1.7 billion people don't have access to a bank account yet. So we have uh, you know uh, that amount unbanked. Um, and we know that there's an over a five trillion um, funding problem for SMEs. Yeah, so so there's there's two massive big global problems, and um, you know, and there is a different generation saying, uh, yeah, we don't just want to make the world happy, but we actually really want to sort of get stuck in and figure out how we can solve solve those problems. So, um, so yeah, I think um, purpose really, really important. Um, here at Finasta, we talk about doing well by doing good. Um, and um, uh, not only does the FusionFabric.cloud platform almost create an enabler that many can um, uh, drive change on, but um, ourselves personally, we're pretty big in the US. Um, and so we're very inquisitive about some of the, um, the challenges that that market has. And if you look in the US, of that 1.7 billion um, that can't or don't have access to a bank account, 55 million in the US don't have access to a bank account, which is absolutely disgraceful. 22% of the of the US is unbanked and another 17 percent are underbanked yeah, yeah that, which is is just um uh is just amazing and um you know of course uh what you, sorry go on Christoph. no that's a very important topic indeed the uh unbanked and financial inclusion and yesterday you know, I, okay, oh can you hear me yeah i'm here can you hear me guys okay I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay. sorry and uh, can you hear me sharon Okay. Uh, financial Just inclusion, that. of course, is a very important topic. Yesterday, I hosted another live stream, actually, with a great panel about financial inclusion and what could be done to help drive that. And one of the key challenges, again, when you said uh, 1.7 billion people don't have access uh, um, to financial services, it's even, of course, worse, the representation of women in that. Uh, it's like 9 or 10% only of that figure, which is uh, yeah. incredibly uh, uh, dramatic, actually, especially in 2020. Uh, so that's, that's thank you very much for your input. On that uh, note, uh, we talk about diversity. The one thing which which bugs me, sorry for lack of better words, <laughs> even if you're not like genuinely like a, not a philanthropist or altruistic as an organization, it's kind of almost proven, proven that uh, driving diversity uh, is basically a vector of success, is good for business because the more diverse your teams, your organization, the better you can connect with your diverse customer base. So it seems like a, almost trivial or like, a, so Sharon, how come that that's not enough almost again for lack of better words to really like drive accelerate that transformation from a cultural standpoint in almost every single especially large organization on the face of earth all right so what, what's the question why given it's good for business aren't we doing it so, <laughs> not diversity is good for business indeed so why is that isn't it enough to really accelerate again the yeah, so look, I um I sort of have two points of view. So one is I um completely get the business case, and um you know there's great research um from Harvard or McKinsey that sort of says if you've got more diversity, uh, some diversity in your in in your ex executive and board, then you're 25 percent more likely to be in the top quartile. And if you've got 30 percent, you're 50 percent in terms of business impact. So, so there's tons of research that says um, it, it is, and particularly when you've got enough diversity, then you really get the benefit the benefit of it. Um, so, so I have I, I sort of intellectually sort of get have that point of view, and then the other is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really, if I'm allowed to say, bored of having this conversation <laughs> um, because I'm 51 and I've been sort of having a version of this conversation for a good 25 years. Déjà vu. Um, and um, 
uh, and uh, you know, and like I'm, you know, I'm in 2020, and and it's 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 a little tedious if I'm really honest. So so it's it, it, it yes, there's a business case, but honestly, um, you know, we're, we're here here we are, and we just need to sort of grab all the great talent and get it into our companies and allow it to innovate and and create tons of value, uh, as well as just make environments way more interesting and exciting to work in really and um and and and, you know the reason why i think it's hard is uh, i mean we've heard a lot um, particularly coming out of the u.s about systemic racism and to be honest i think here in the u.s there's some really nice um uh um news pieces that say might not be quite as bad as the u.s but it's not that much better here either in terms of some of the different institutions that we've got to uh, figure out and those institutions of course are government but they're also organizations and and some of it is overt and some of it is is covert and some of it is even just we don't really realize we're doing half of what we're doing and so you know so many institutions have been put in place for hundreds of years and we're just set in a way of thinking and working and you know we we've, we've really got to reset the clock on some of what we're doing and, and that's hard yeah it's hard but it's taking a little bit too long if uh, if you ask me indeed yeah uh, so that was more from a corporate standpoint uh, cecile and uh, nadia i'm sure you've got a lot of things to say but uh, if i may uh, do you want to talk now i've got a subsequent question which i think is even uh, more relevant it's just the next step is how can you then build an inclusive culture a more inclusive one so is it like to establish a due diligence process that looks at the, at the culture aspect of uh, is it like to change the leadership of an organization because uh, for instance harvard business business review said that without diverse leadership women are 20 percent less likely than straight white men to win endorsements for their ideas um what needs to be done then to drive and to to uh, foster those more inclusive cultures within existing or new organizations Cecil? Yeah, that that's the that's a million dollar question, isn't it? And I think, you know, as Sharon said, I'm also bored of having this conversation. And <laughs> you know, there there is constant talk. And um, if you look back to 2017 when uh there was a review done on race in the workplace by uh McGregor Smith, um that out out of that came um, you know, uh the guidelines and a race action plan. Uh I think it was called the Race at Work Charter um, that was set up and all of these large companies signing up to commit to do better with race in the workplace. And the very first step of that uh, charter was simply to measure, right, simply to measure and report. And up to this day, only 50 percent of those companies that sign up are able to measure and report, which is sad because you can't improve something unless you're measuring it. And, you know, I guess we have to ask ourselves, why aren't companies measuring it? It's probably low on their priority uh, ladder. So how do we shift it up the priority ladder? You know, businesses work on, you know, solid business cases. And I know, you know, Sharon was talking about the research that is out there, Um, Mm -hmm. but it's one of those things like, you know, when you know you need to go to the gym and you keep delaying, but you know (laughs) that you need to go to the gym, right? You, you want to be healthy, but you don't go to the gym and you know that's the way to go. So mm. I think we need to think about the human aspect of it. And it's probably things like bias training or even doing philanthropic uh, stuff for the community and putting people in those companies in touch with people that mm. they've never uh, seen or worked with before, uh, just to kind of get them more familiar with people from different cultures. I think that's really important. No, those are good, uh, good initiatives. And Nadia, I think you're going to like that topic, like, because <laughs> you're one of the proponents of saying that it's good, but the companies usually being proactively communicating about those issues are the ones the most advanced. So it doesn't necessarily reflect, you know, the, the situation in an industry. So please share your views on that. Yeah, thank you, Christophe. You know me, like I've, I've been sitting here like, oh God, I've got, I've got to hold in what I need to say. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I I totally agree with all the comments. Yes, it's boring. Why haven't we made a change by now? It's it's ridiculous that we haven't. People know and understand that profits are linked to, uh, inextricably linked to diverse teams. Like it is absolutely, it's almost like we're self-harming 
our businesses um, because we're not willing to change. And I think it does go back to that that uh, old adage of um, human beings are rubbish at change. You know, we either need to have something that we want to run towards because we love it so much or something that's really hurt us too much to actually make change happen. And I think that um, I've um, every time I've interviewed, in, uh, I've, I've introduced my podcast series. I've always said we are here today to walk the talk for change. And the reason why I say walk the talk is because, do you know what? I completely agree. It's boring to keep on talking, talking, talking. But what is happening after events like this? What happened last year, all the events that people went to? Did, did people go back to their chief people officers and say, I heard this? What's our policy? What are we doing? What actually are we doing for change? And, um, you know, this, this year in lockdown, I had a baby. Um, and um, I listened to so many podcasts in um, nighttime feeds. And I really educated myself on a lot of things. And something that got me really annoyed is the lack of change. Um, and I got really, like, really ang like, like emotional, like angry about it. And I was like, right, if no one's going to make this change happen, I have to. And I'm starting with gender. I know that's only one piece of the diversity pie, but I'm starting with gender. And as a recruiter, I am basically calling calling people to action. See, I've even got music going on. No, it's not my, it wasn't my sound. Um, but I am calling companies um, to action in our industry to incite real change in this. And what I'm doing is I've launched a campaign called the 17% list, because yes, we still only have 17% females in technology. And that figure has stayed the same for the last five years. So all our work, going to girls at school, go, my, all my talks at university, what everything that I've been doing other people have been doing to try and attract more people to the industry we are stuck at 17 percent. so what i thought is we need to actually just rip apart the playbook when it comes to hiring and we have always always traditionally hired by saying here's a vacancy this is the box that the vacancy is going to fit into we'd like you to fit into that box please be diverse as well please but fit into that box and fit into it on my time scale and I think businesses and companies, we need to realize that if we want to attract more diverse talent to this industry, we have to change the way we're behaving rather than saying, women, why don't you just give it a go? Like this new phrase of women, go on, give it a go, try something new. How about companies try something new? Let's give it a go. So what I'm doing is I am taking great female technical talent, and I'm presenting it to companies when they're not looking to hire. And I'm saying, look, you care about diversity, what can you do with this profile? Can you go out and do something about it? And it's really interesting, the feedback, because there are some people saying, this is a great initiative, let's go, let's do something about it. And they're changing the whole way that they're working. There are others that change is just too tough. I could go on forever, Christopher. I know you're no, listening to uh, no, so it's, very, it's it's very uh, it's very um, interesting and uh, and insightful. Uh, to, in order to drive change, right? I think it's pretty true from anything we're trying to accomplish, especially in a big organization. One of the best ways, arguably, is to incentivize people to do so. So, what could be done or has been done at a uh, company level to embed some kind of KPIs and metrics within the balance scorecard of the organization or the senior leaders to, again, make sure the inclusion and the diversity agenda is high on the list of priorities. As a recruiter, do you see a lot of that, actually, when you approach organization? Yeah, so um, um, yeah, we have definitely seen, and, and actually, I've been doing a huge call to action this year on this, like really asking people, what are your metrics and are you measuring this? Um, uh, and I did that especially after the abandonment of the gender pay gap in the UK this year. Um, I've also been following the MP, the Labour MP, Stella Creasy, who, um, if anyone follows me on LinkedIn, will see I'm constantly posting pictures of her in Parliament, do it like holding her baby um, and almost like feeding her baby in Parliament while saying women women deserve to be paid just the same as men. Um, and I think that um, the abandonment of the gender, pay, the gender pay gap this year was was horrific and bad decision by the government. Um, but I do think that a lot of companies in the fintech community did step up. Of course, there'll be loads that didn't, um, that, that were allowed to hide. Um, but a lot of them did, did step up and I've been in touch with so many of them talking about what they are trying to do. And I think measuring is a great start, but the companies that think that implementing quotas with their recruitment agencies is going to answer the uh, answer the problem, I think that on its own, on its own, 
Terrible. Mm. <laughs> right. And that, that would that would deserve a proper conversation, the conversation yeah. of quotas actually. But but Sharon, for instance, like um, to talk about that, so metrics KPIs, their value yeah. implementing such a rigorous process. And does the lack of transparency from organization uh, impair again the acceleration of a more diverse environment? Like companies still don't report on workforce diversity, or a lot of them, and even fintech, they don't really report on the users you know the customer side of things to tell us how many women are using services versus men so would that help yeah so gosh there's a lot of different points there so i'm going to give you some um philosophical views as well as some data points so um i, I heard quotas you know should should we have quotas or or not um i i you know i flip flop here Everything in my being says no. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I, I just don't think that that's the right way to go. Um, equally, you then look at, um, you know, um, South Africa, and they tried um, to move the dial um, for 20 years, and it didn't move. And then they introduced black economic empowerment. Now, to some degree, that does move the dial, but not always elegantly. Yeah, and so I sort of, you know. But fundamentally, I think I'm, I'm a, um, you know, we've got to have a, a positive move forward rather than overtly forcing people to do things. I think that always has unintended consequences. Um, second, um, uh, measuring, I'm a massive fan of measuring. So in, in my previous life, I was part of the European Roundtable and we measured um, from the early um, 90s. And um, at, you know, at the beginning, nobody gave a hoot. Yeah, so people just measured and it didn't make any difference. Um, but, but actually the, the ritual of measuring, um, then I think by the time uh, people started to care, you were in the rhythm of measuring, which is why when I joined Finastra, I was like, who's the top 200? 22% women um, and in 18 months, 30% women. Um, I have to say, Nadia, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to measure the hell out of um, uh, recruiters because I expect you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't believe we should have measured. And actually, with my um, seven percent list, I know that the measurement would be great. So. Exactly. So, so I think um, uh, you know because uh, I, and I, you know I, I think everybody's got to step up, in, including recruiters. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know to 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 because because again philosophically my, my view is the people that you have inside the company everyone is the same yeah so uh whether you're a man or woman uh from a different culture different sexual orientation then my driver internally is the best person for the job yeah when when you look externally then i'm absolutely going to over index on hiring difference with fantastic skills yeah um, because uh, you know, because that that is not unfair. Yeah, that, that I'm not being um, biased to my internal um, folks, and that's why when we look at um, entry hiring, we actually hire 60% women uh, in in that group rather than um, you know even 50-50 because we've got an opportunity to build a pipeline that will allow us to balance out over time. So so I think in short. Not, not keen on quotas, massively keen on um, measuring. Um, and, and, and generally, though, we have got to keep this a positive agenda with people feeling like everybody can be included. People are not going to be exposed and shamed um, because I, I, I think what you're trying to do is create a culture that when no one is looking, people do the right thing, not that they do the right thing when people can see them but then when you know when, when the lights go off um th then actually it's not as positive a culture as 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 you might think and i think you do that by winning the argument as opposed to um uh, you know shaming people into in in in, in into doing things so anyway lots of lots of different views there so, so what do you think thank you Sharon. yeah please this one yeah, I, I'll just add a few points. I, I agree with you, um, Sharon, about measuring. Measuring is so important. And, you know, as someone that has spent most of my career in data and analytics, um, I know what sort of action can be brought about by measuring something. 
one thing that I've um, I'm also thinking about is when you are a minority in a company, you you don't want to um, alert people as to the fact that you're a minority. It sounds weird, but you know, if as a black person I'm in a company, anytime there's a form or some data that's being collected, I really don't think it's in my interest to tick tick the box and go, yeah, black African um, male here. And oftentimes when you've got so few people from that uh, minority in your company and there's a pulse survey, for example, and, it, you know, the questions are, how do you feel about management? How are we doing? And there's only maybe one black person in the team. And it's so easy to know that that's the person that gave us the negative um, review. Right. So it kind of it highlights you some somewhat when when you're in a company with not a lot of uh, people and, and, and these um, these surveys are done. Um, so it's about how do you measure in a way that, um, uh, you know, caters for different people and their preferences without scaring them or, or bringing them into uh, into conflict. Mm -hmm. no, no, I think what, it's what, a few things. Are yeah, a few, few things I would add. So I think um, it's relatively easy to to measure men and women. Yeah, because because you know that's slightly more tried and tested. Of course, sexual orientation um, you know make makes it less straightforward. Yeah, so you know so so it's very blunt saying you know I, I've got X percentage of of, of women. Um, I think um, uh, when, when I look at um, uh looking at ethnic inclusion um and um uh you know the, one of the problems and this and this is so you know why is it really hard because it's about families governments communities companies all broadly wanting the same goal and of course across that spectrum um you know uh we can't all line up yeah and that's why it's really complicated um, and, and if you look at something like cultural inclusion, if the world could only get its act together and get a list, a simple list of, um, you know, how you would measure it, it would make it so much easier for global companies to measure cultural inclusion. And, and we're just trying to do that um, in Finastro Camp Me In program for different cultures because we have about 30 percent of people that don't declare um, uh, uh, but it's really hard, yeah, and, and um, the McGregor report, et cetera, I mean, it fa we found it hard on that, yeah, because the UK, the US, Portugal, you know, everyone's doing something different, which then means it's a barrier to, to, to trying to figure it out. Nevertheless, I think you've got to try and push through it, and, and see, so I think it's so sad that you sort of say, you know, as a, um, as a, um, a black man, I'm afraid to tick, in, because in, in case my company can or you know can figure out who I am because that almost says to me um you know you'd be in the wrong company if you felt that you were not secure enough to say who you were and the company would not use your data with great care yeah and, uh, and uh, yeah so I'm being real yeah but but I think you know I think message to companies yeah we've got to um you know get trust with our workforces because if we if we don't understand what different groups of people feel yeah then we can't design systems and processes and cultures mm. that work for mm. everyone yeah, i mean it, you know we're we're failing before we even start cecil yeah yeah no per personally i'd say i've kind of uh, grown grown past that but i know how it is to be a young um person from an ethnic minority background in sure. a large company and uh, you know, I know that there's so many others out there that that feel the same way. So mm -hmm. I I need to speak up for them. For so sure, I, no, no, no. It's a reflection of you. Yeah, this is a reflection of 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 us companies. Yeah, mm. Got a, and the industry. I think it's a, a really, and I think this is actually the call to action right now. Um, because there are so many businesses that put policies in place that are simply to tick boxes. And that authenticity that I spoke about at the beginning, 
um, you know, we, we can all talk about why why there is this inextricable link between profits um, and diversity. But but what happens when companies are doing it to say, yes, we, we do care about diversity, but actually they really don't. And when people do put their hand up and say, I, I felt in that meeting I was mansplained the whole way through that mm. meeting. Or I felt that when I gave feedback, it wasn't listened to. And the oh. answers are, oh, no, I think you got the wrong end of the stick there. Um, and, and we spoke about this before that I think there's something that's that's terribly detrimental in the in, in you know what in, in the workplace in general rather than just the fintech industry. Um, and I think that what's detrimental is this sort of passive uh, discrimination, this sort of sort of knock knock you know knocking away at, at confidence and the ability to be able to say, I believe this is wrong. And so one of my key things that I talk to different companies about, it's really simple, listen and act. Don't listen and rebut, listen and act. And I think that, it, you know, that it's really hit home to you, Sharon, to hear what C Cecil said. But actually, I, I hear these sorts of stories all the time. Um, and it is heartbreaking, because we, what is the point of putting these putting policies in place if you're not going to listen to your people? Um, so I think it's a really important point. I think that that's very fair, yes. And uh, if I step back, the, the data measurement thing is important, but with lack of standards, as you said, it's pretty difficult to compare yourself. If we uh, talk about uh, aggressions, because you just talked about it, active aggression, passive aggression, even microaggressions, which are comments or actions by which someone reflects their unconscious biases towards a group of obsessed people. How do you how do you deal with those and uh, eliminate those from the workplace, Sharon? How easy or difficult is it to do? Because it's at the individual level. There's so much you can do. Of course, recruitment, you could argue you recruit the right people to fit the right culture, but and which is challenging uh, on its own. So how can yeah. we deal with that collectively? So it's hard. And, um, uh, you know, women, black men, LGBTQ, everyone has biases, yeah. So, um, and and actually, there's a, a lot of research that says women are as biased to other women, and all sorts of things. Yeah. So it, it's, um, you know, it, it, it and actually, um, some of my biggest supporters, both for me personally and also for the work that I've, um, you know, done throughout my life, um, have, have been white older men. Yeah, um, and um, and I applaud the fact that actually there are a lot of really good people, um, it, you know, all shapes and sizes that are really trying to move um, this agenda on. But you know, so fundamentally, as human beings, we we have biases because it's the only way that we can process the trillions bits of information that head to us, and so we, um, you know, we synthesize um, and uh, and and um, uh, and use our biases to try and just sort of get th get through the day yeah so so um at, uh, you know so so they're there we've all got them um and um uh, and you have to tackle it in two levels so one is for sure at the individual level and that's about education conversations creating a culture that if somebody doesn't quite get something right constructively and positively coaches them to move on i always think it's got to be positive yeah you know the day as i said you, you name and shame people that that doesn't create the culture so you have to have the sort of the the stuff that you do at, at the front line almost but fundamentally um you know you have to change the system yeah and and so you know my, my experience of working in large organizations is the three things you have to have a rallying cry yeah in um in finastra it for us it's to be the most loved most inclusive employer in fintech you have to light fires you have to do real things walk the talk as you said nadia yeah you can't just sort of say it and hope something happens and as part of that you have to go end to end and change pretty much every process every system uh you know all the policies yeah and you have to look through the lens of um, cultural difference, LGBTQ difference, gender difference, uh, thinking, yeah, because it's not just about, you know, it's, it, there's so much difference, yeah, but you have to look at policies that were probably put in 30 years ago, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, for some companies even longer, and you have to change them. And then you have to, you have to get people on that movement with you yeah you have you have to move your your um your, your organization so so unfortunately to really change it, it it's like you have to be you have to approach it in a fairly clever way yeah there isn't 
there isn't a silver bullet, which I have to say has irritated so many CEOs across the world because they just wanted that one thing that you would do and, and then the sun would shine. And this is just too complicated an agenda. Yeah, um, you know, it hits on too many things. So you have to you have to have a systemic view to changing it. And you absolutely have to have people at the top of the organization for whom this is a passion. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it's got to be something that you think about every day, um, because the minute you don't, then you look around and 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 actually the the wrong cultural ways of working have grown have grown back up. So um, yeah, so it's it's super hard, and that's why most people just get waylaid on other things. Yeah, so to really do it properly, it, it there is science and art coming coming together, um, and and most people get distracted and then end up focusing on other things, and they never quite crack it. Is, is my sort of 25 plus years experience of trying to help companies do this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And Cecil, do you want to add anything? It, as you said, it needs to be embedded in the very fabric of who we are, of the society. Mm -hmm. It needs to become a habit, like something we do and the way we behave. And we shouldn't have to talk about those topics. I totally agree with all of you. Yeah. So, uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah. So the, on the topic of microaggressions, um, I think it's very difficult to understand microaggressions as a white person in this country. Um, I'll give you an example. So the editor in chief of Vogue magazine earlier this year, yes. he went into his workplace and the security guard told him to use the loading bay. Right. This is the editor, editor in chief. He's not like a senior ranking. He's not a senior manager. He's the he's the top guy. And that is a, a good example of the microaggressions. And um, he probably knew when he went into the company that there was there was there was um, a slight percentage that he might be perceived in a certain way. And just walking around with that nagging feeling, that is where the microaggression chips away at you on a daily basis. And it's not just within the workplace; it's within the shops that you go to every time you come out your house. If you live in a white neighborhood, you know the clothes that you're wearing in that neighborhood. They're microaggressions just flying at you. So it's a it's a it's a thing that exists, and I don't think it's there's a, a an easy way to get rid of it in companies. But there is an easy way to train people and make sure that they are aware of themselves when these thoughts come into their mind. Oh, just because he's black and he's coming in at this time doesn't actually mean that he is working in the distribution industry. I don't know. Um, people, ne people need to be trained, right? That's, that's how we can um, tackle this. Uh, you, you, yeah, we're touching the unconscious bias. So that's the most difficult, of course, to, uh, to get rid of. But it's still appalling, sorry for lack of better words, that happens in 2020, mm. especially in the UK. Or, um, so we're almost there, like five minutes left. Um, there's a couple of questions, but one we already answered, which is, uh, what is the industry doing to change the way we hire and each leader be measured or even rewarded by making sure they are doing something consciously to have a diverse team? So we kind of touch the, the metrics, maybe KPIs and, uh, and having the right leadership at the top. So I think I don't think there's too much to add to that. There's one question I, I think, especially for you, Nadia. Someone said, when you, Jessica said, when you say 17% of girls in tech does this refer to technical roles or just roles within the tech industry? Um, roles within the tech industry. Um, so I, I'm glad that question was asked because um, I think that there is a misconception, especially to people outside uh, the industry, that tech is just coding. Um, and there's there's such a plethora of such exciting roles that that um, foster so much creativity, innovation, collaboration. Um, and, and you know what? I'm, I'm actually describing development and coding as, as I say that, you know, it's a, it, that there's such a, there is such a, a, a multitude of skill sets that, that now mean technology roles. And I think that um, what I'm trying to do with this 17% list is I'm, I'd love to call it the 18% list next year and the 19% list. Um, but for me, it was just me getting creative and thinking, what have we never done before? and let me see if it works. And I've, I've only started this campaign since September when I came back from maternity leave, and I've already signed up 65 different companies to it within the industry. And my goal is to hit 100 by Christmas, because I think, imagine if 100 sponsors within, business, within businesses by Christmas will not allow someone to say, in, in their company, oh, I'd have loved to have hired a woman, but we just couldn't find one. And imagine if that gets shut down now, 
a hundred people out there are going, well, that's not true because I see evidence week in, week out. I see many, many female technical profiles. Um, and it's been brilliant because um, I, I already roles have been created for these women. And as I said at the start, I've only started it with, with um, the gender slice of the diversity pie. I'm going to take it much wider than that. So we we'll keep uh, we keep uh, you posted and each other posted then. So we'll have to wrap up soon. So maybe Cecil, yeah, do you have to add? Add it? Um... Sorry. Apologies, Sharon. Ah, I lost Sharon. We lost Sharon. So uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was going. So uh, you know, I know I know we're talking about companies, but, but can you, can you hear? we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I know. Is it delayed or? <laughs> I think it's delayed. Ah, so. I'll give you a fact, and uh, yeah, yeah, please, 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 Sharon. Can you hear? And then Cecil. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we can, mm -hmm. we can. So, so I know we're talking about companies. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. I know we're talking about companies, but the reality is, there's tons of parents watching here. And if you look in the 1980s, 37% of the people doing computer science were women, girls. Yeah, and um. Uh, and now we have 18%. Yeah, and I know tech has many things that women can do, and I know we're not just talking about women, but these are almost proxies for difference, yeah. Um, and, I do, you know, I do, I do think that in, in addition to having women across fintech generally, you know, I also want to see more women at, in the heartbeat of it, yeah, which is the technology, And, and so, uh, you know, my, my ask of, um, of our, all of us as parents, parents of, um, uh, you know, uh, young black boys, young girls, young kids that are LGBTQ, um, uh, you know, oriented, yeah, is, you know, how do we encourage them to be drawn to technology, the core of technology? Yeah, because there is a supply issue when you start to see that over a period of time, the amount of folks, um, even girls, has halved. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's not going to help the physical design of products be designed with difference in mind. Yeah, so, you right. know, many parents out there, so let, it's not just about what, what we're doing in organisations, it's also the coaching and encouragement that we're giving our children that have got diverse backgrounds to sort of say, you know, Come on, get coding. Yeah. Okay. Again, everybody's got a responsibility actually to to step up and deal with diversity. Uh, Cecil, if you want to say something, then I've got two quick questions I want to uh, from the audience. I'd like to uh, share with you, and then I will wrap up. So please. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know Nadia was saying humans are rubbish at change, and as leaders, we need to help people um, be more enlightened about certain things in our society. Um, I was reading the other day that 33% uh, of school pupils in this country are from ethnic minority backgrounds. That has a massive implication on the future of uh, this country. And we need to start creating inclusive environments so that these uh, you know, pupils, when they are adults, can contribute and do feel included, right? So as leaders, how do we help people change and we need to use our leadership skills to do that and not necessarily rely on people to do that themselves. No, you're totally right, uh, both uh, Sharon uh, and Cecil and of course Nadia. Super quickly, because I'm conscious of time. I mean, it's not really questions. Uh, one I will redirect maybe to Nadia from Sylvia. As a Latino woman with banking experience and looking to entering the fintech industry, what are some of the things I can do to show recruiting teams how my diversity can help the company? especially when I have always tried to fit in. So do you mind if I invite Sylvia maybe to... to call me, definitely you call me. And um, I mean, we could do a whole hour on this. I will support <laughs> you. Um, I think it's all about uh, making sure that um, as, a, as a recruiter that we are representing people properly. So um, I definitely would like to take that one offline. And, so and yeah, I'll, I'll, share you the, I'll share the name with you. So Sylvia from LinkedIn uh, and uh, Blythe. She said, it's not a question. I think that if we reframe tech and finance for girls as solving issues, they find start, they find start with their hyper-local culture. So basically they use uh, and they bring a lot to the table. And I think it's probably a, a great way to, 
kind of finish up the conversation today. Uh, thank you so much. Again, I was honored to be uh, the modest host today. Conversation was great. We touched the surface because we could spend hours and hours talking about the topic. But thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's always it's just a, a start of a conversation we mentioned. Please feel free to reach out to us and especially the panelists directly on social, I guess, LinkedIn for everybody at least. Um, thank you again, uh, Nadia, Cecile and Sharon. And please also check, of course, their respective websites. So Harrington Star, Thunder Vine, and of course, Finastra. Uh, and of course, last but, not, last but not least, sorry, check out uh, Hack to the Future, our hackathon, where we aim together to help to redefine finance for good. So thank you very much all and uh, see you in the next one. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. Christoph. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, everyone. Last year, Hack to the Future brought together 1,080 hackers from 38 countries. 235 ideas were submitted and 122 published. Over 50,000 in prizes were awarded to the winners. It was incredible. Bright, motivated hackers from around the globe collaborated to build inspiring innovations in the world of financial services, from corporate and retail banking to payments and capital markets. Ideas and new solutions were born. Now, we invite you to Finastra's 2020 Hack to the Future. Hacking systemic inequality, embracing technology-enabled change, hacking through COVID-19. So, are you ready? Our challenge themes support inclusion and diversity. Help us amplify the voices of the unheard. Give the unprivileged the same access to tools and opportunities necessary to succeed in this life. Integrate physical and digital experiences. Find new growth streams and embed fintech across industries. Accelerate open innovation with a global developer community. Hacking around the clock, around the globe. We'll host virtual learning and network events and an online community where you can ask questions, share ideas, and get support. Enter for your chance to win prizes, like internship opportunities with Finastra, waived fees for apps ready for our open innovation platform on fusionfabric.cloud, and other incredible prizes from our partners. Go to fintech.devpost.com for full details and to get started. See you there.